That's what you call a group of flamingos. Elephants heard in a parade. A group of zebras is called a dazzle. Whatever the name, being part of a group has advantages. Hanging with the herd fends off predators, helps with mating, and sometimes it makes it easier to bring up baby. Forget privacy. From day one, the world for a Chilean flamingo is a busy place. The same goes for flamingos at a zoo. And a two-week-old chick like Tweedle might get lost in the shuffle. He lives at Reed Park Zoo in Tucson, Arizona. When flamingo chicks first hatch, they are white little puff balls, and they've got black legs and black bills. As they get older, that down gradually starts to turn gray. At about 40 days, they start getting feathers. It'll be a while before Tweedle turns pink, but right from the get-go, he's displaying his personality. So this chick is a little more apprehensive about coming off the nest than our previous chicks have been. It took Tweedle over a week before it felt comfortable coming off the nest and exploring, but this one's gonna stick closer to mom and dad than our previous chicks did. That cautious attitude should suit both of Tweedle's protective parents just fine. With flamingos, both mom and dad help take care of the chicks. So they both help to build the nest. They both sit on the egg. The parents pile up a mound of mud to raise it above the water level to protect the egg. There's no risk of flooding here at the zoo, but the behavior is instinctive. A female flamingo will only lay one egg a season, so the male and female go to great lengths to keep it safe. With so many flamingos around, that's not easy to do. They like to live in very large flocks, and they stay very close together, but they're constantly squabbling. They're always kind of chirping at each other and kind of just giving little knocks on the head to each other. While a crowded group life may lead to squabbling, the flamingo's mating ritual, especially in the wild, is a striking display. It's truly flamboyant. For flamingos to have successful breeding, they have a very weird behaviors that they do as a flock. So they march around, they do these wing salutes, they do a thing called head flagging, where they all turn their heads at the same time. Flamingos really have the hang of group living which is as essential at the zoo as it is in the wild. If there are fewer than 15 flamingos in a zoo, it's a problem. If they don't have enough of them, they won't build nests and they won't lay eggs. So it's really important to have enough flamingos in order to make them feel comfortable enough to breed. Once a chick is born, flamingo parents share other duties like feeding. Adults produce what's known as crop milk and pass it into a youngster's beak. Tweedle, as you can see, has a very different bill than the parents have. His is much smaller and pointier. But as he gets older, at about 40 days, that bill's gonna start to curve down so he has the same type of bill as mom and dad. When Tweedle is an adult, that banana shape will pay off at mealtime. Flamingos have a unique way of eating where they'll stick their head in the water and it's upside down. Their beaks are like big scoops and gather in everything, including muddy water. When their beaks close, the morsels of food stay in, but their tongues move quickly to push the water out. This filtering technique lets them eat tiny crustacean and insect larvae, which are the reason behind the flamingo's distinctively colored feathers. The shrimp and mollusks are loaded with beta-carotene, the same stuff that makes carrots orange. That makes its way through the flamingo's bloodstream and into their feathers. The zoo can only give them some of the same food they'd find in the wild, so they also have a supplement. 
There's a very special diet that we buy that's specifically for flamingos. And this has all the nutritional things that they need in it, as well as the same type of pigments in it that will help keep them pink. Becoming and staying pink are important, especially for the males. Pale flamingos are not as attractive to females as really pink flamingos. Tweedle won't turn pink for at least a couple of years, but he is developing another hallmark of flamingos, the one-legged pose. It's mostly for comfort. If you think about how when a person stands, uh, when they're just standing in one place for a long time, they usually put their weight on one leg or the other. The only difference is the flamingos lift that leg up. Other research suggests it helps the birds conserve body heat. Tweedle's a quick study, but he's still timid. While another flamingo waits for her egg to hatch, little Tweedle stays close, under the watchful eye of his parents. As close as Tweedle can get. They're just a couple of weeks old. So these three reindeer calves, named Daisy, Aster, and Sawyer, are still getting comfortable moving about. They're not ready to pull a sleigh from the North Pole, but it won't be long until they can try. When reindeer are first born, they weigh about 10 pounds and within their first hour are able to walk around and keep up with mom, and then after a day they're able to outrun a human. Reindeer are found in many northern countries. The ones at the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg, Manitoba are Eurasian tundra reindeer. In North America, they're also known as caribou. One of the most important instincts Daisy, Aster, and Sawyer will develop is to shadow their mothers. In the wild, the babies need to learn herd mentality so that they know to stay with the herd since there is safety in numbers. They'll go between cycles of walking around to look for a different grazing area, and then they'll switch into a resting mode, and they all tend to follow one leader. Reindeer or caribou herds head north in the summer. That's when they're drawn to the tundra, which is lush with grasses and plants. It's a massive migration, a journey of hundreds of kilometers. Reindeer stand out in the deer family for other reasons too. They are the only species of deer in which females can have antlers. Both uh, male and female babies will start developing their antlers uh, within two to three weeks of being born. And when they first start out, they'll just be little nubs that's on the top of their head. It might be hard to tell, but little bumps are starting to emerge on Daisy's head. You won't need to squint at those nubs long. Reindeer have the second largest antlers of any deer after moose. Antlers are made of bone, and they grow from the top of the skull. They grow forward from the tips, and to help them grow, they get a velvet skin layer that helps deliver blood and nutrients to them as they grow. Male reindeer lose their antlers at the beginning of the winter. They regrow later that same season, and by the time summer comes, they can measure up to a meter long and weigh more than 20 kilograms. Female reindeer, on the other hand, keep their antlers through winter until spring. So those big, brave reindeer guiding Santa's sleigh, like Donner, Dasher, and Rudolph, are all females. Reindeer shed more than their antlers. When the weather turns warm, they don't need the protection of their heavy winter coat. So off it comes. A shorter, darker coat will come through for the summer months. Living in large herds can sometimes lead to confusion. Sometimes the babies will go to the wrong mom and they'll try and nurse off her, um, but often the mom will, will shoo them off so that she has enough milk for her calf. 
The calves will stay with the mom and drink milk for the first month almost exclusively. And after that, they'll start to graze. Sawyer is a hungry little thing. Reindeer milk will take care of that. It's one of the richest milks of any land mammal. It's got 22% butter fat compared to cow's milk at 4%. After these babies are weaned, it's onto solid food. In the wild, that means lichens. The snow will cover the lichens that they eat, and they have to be able to detect where they are in order to dig down to get to them. A very good sense of smell helps the reindeer find the buried food. But there is another helpful adaptation that scientists believe is unique to this mammal. Reindeer have special vision, which allows them to better see lichens in the dim light of the Arctic winter. Recently, scientists have discovered that reindeer can see UV light. Their keen eyesight also helps them avoid competition. Now, the UV light will help them see traces of pea or fur, which will allow them to see if there's other reindeer in the area that might be competing with them for food, or it'll help them better pick out predators such as wolves that are camouflaged in the snow. Daisy, Aster, and Sawyer are happy just to see Mum. When they wake up and they notice they're a little bit further from Mum, they'll start crying for Mum, making a honking sound to get her attention. These little calves will grow up quickly. Until then, sticking with mom is a wise step. It might not be obvious at first, but elephants and humans have a lot in common. They're emotional, intelligent, and highly social. Like humans, elephants also take a long time to grow up and growing up means constantly learning. That's certainly the case with Nandi, a 14-month-old elephant that lives with her family at the Reed Park Zoo in Tucson, Arizona. Just a few months earlier, when Nandi was about eight months old, she stuck close to her mom, Semba. Nandi was staying a little closer to mom, so she was a little less confident, more concerned with how close she was to her mom. She would frighten a little more easily and run back to mom and check in with her. Nandi was learning how to be an elephant, experimenting with her trunk, timidly stepping into the pool, and figuring out her place in the family. In the wild, Nandi might be part of an all-female herd led by an experienced matriarch. The herd would nurture her and eventually teach her how to raise calves on her own. In the zoo, she's getting both the nurturing and education from all of the members of her family. There's dad, Mabu, mom, Semba, and three siblings, eight-year-old Punga, four-year-old Sunju, and of course, Nandi. Lunjil is another adult female who helps with the youngsters. It's a big family, and each of the elephants has a role to play. We can see how our herd works together in that the kids, the young elephants, play all day. But when they get really rowdy, oftentimes one of the adults will come and often it's mom who might discipline one sibling or one of the brothers for being too rough on Nandi. Nandi doesn't seem to mind. As she gets older, she wants to play with her big brothers and doesn't want to be left out of the fun, even if it means pushing herself. The pool is a little bit frightening um, to a baby elephant initially, and so she's becoming brave, curious, and independent swimming on her own. Her family's showing her the ropes. She's learning from them, just like human babies do. So Nandi's learning how to interact with her environment in part from her siblings and her mom. So she does watch them and she mimics them. 
And then the other thing that's interesting is because she's curious, she tries new things. And sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Playing increases her confidence, but she's also just more sure-footed. She runs more smoothly, flaps her ears more confidently, and some of that is just growing into her body. Nandi can also use her feet to communicate. Researchers know that elephants in the wild can send and receive messages through very low frequency sounds. These also travel as vibrations through the ground. So an elephant across the savanna might send a warning call and another might hear it, but also get the news through a rumble it feels through its feet or trunk. At the zoo, Nandi and her family are close together, but they still communicate in the same way. They also do have lots of vocalizations that we can't hear. So sometimes we'll watch their behavior and we suspect that they're rumbling at these low frequencies that we can't hear. And they're saying something to one another based on their body postures. Just as human babies become more nimble with their fingers, elephants become more agile with their trunks. Nandi's trunk, when she was a very young elephant, it was as though she had a spaghetti noodle hanging from her face. When she would run, it would just flop around, where now she really is becoming quite skillful at using it. Nandi's trunk is now less spaghetti and more of a fine tool that can help her get what she wants. That's because a network of muscles gives her incredible control over her trunk's movements. Nandi and her mom use their trunks to stay in touch. Sometimes Semba gives Nandi a friendly nudge. Other times, they share food. So, Nandi's trunk is a nose, a hand, a voice, and a straw, all in one. And her mom's is still an occasional blanket. Nandi still has a lot of learning to do. But now that she's 14 months old, it's easy to see the changes. She's become much more independent and curious and charges right ahead of mom and doesn't worry about how close her mom is following her. But she's still a toddler. And like all toddlers, she knows exactly where mom is when she needs her. This baby zebra, Graham, looks all right now. But four months ago, his handlers at New Key Zoo in Cornwall, England, were concerned. The baby had just been born and was still wet, and they take a few hours just to get up on their feet, but he slipped a little bit. It could have been the handlers who were wobbly. After all, it was all new to them. Graham was the first zebra calf ever born at the zoo. So it was a little bit dramatic, but we managed to get him up and stand him up, and as soon as he was on his feet, he was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Graham was fine. Like other foals, he was able to walk about 20 minutes after birth. Graham's arrival was a happy surprise for someone else, his mother. Typically, a zebra mare is able to reproduce from age two until 15. Graham's mother is already 14 years old, but Graham is her first foal. I think um, zebra will produce up to 20 years old, but probably in the wild, an older animal like that, anything beyond 15 is probably getting a little bit too old to reproduce. And they would have already produced three or four or five youngsters by then. Graham is a Chapman zebra, a subspecies of the plain zebra that's found in the grasslands of southern Africa. It's a wide open habitat with a range of animals, including large predators. So zebras stay in herds because there's greater safety in numbers. Mares must separate to give birth, but rejoin the herd as quickly as possible. Even at the zoo, mom is very protective of the latest addition to the herd. She is quite defensive. If you watch her, she'll very often stand between the other two zebra and, and the foal. And she does exactly the same with us. She looks upon them as the same she does with the keepers. So she can be quite defensive over him, but only if you get a little bit too close. 
Graham's safe here. And he's healthy, too. Well, this is an interesting thing on, on the growth rate of these zebra. Because this is the first one we've bred at the zoo, we were quite surprised on how quickly he grows. And they appear to grow very quickly at an early stage to become big and strong and be able to get away from predators. And then it seems to slow up. Graham will mature quickly. He might head a tightly knit family group of female zebra and their foals, called a harem. For now, Graham is getting along just fine with the other zebras in the zoo. Zebra's very sociable. He's mixed very well with the other girls, the other female zebra in there. He's also getting used to other species that he would encounter on the savanna. We have wildebeest and, and the yala antelope, but so far we haven't mixed them. We're very careful when they're very young to actually be, uh, not to mix them too much with the other animals. Uh, he has actually mixed with the Inial antelope, which are quite calm, but the wildebeest can be, uh, can be difficult. So, so far, we're just holding back a little bit. Graham will eventually mix with them. Wildebeest are a natural partner in the wild, essentially traveling companions. Large herds of them actually migrate with wildebeest and other antelope, um, and they follow the rains. As the rains go and the rich grass is ahead of them, then they graze it all the way and then, uh, and then come back again. For zebras, wild or captive, eating grass or hay is about quantity, not quality. Zebra actually graze constantly. They don't eat uh, lots and lots of rich food. In the wild, it's very seasonal. You get a dry season and a wet season. And they'll put a lot of weight on, and the, and the foals are often born in the, in the wet season. Uh, in captivity, we have to try and replicate that. Uh, certainly this time of year, this is uh, in their austere re uh, time of the year where there isn't a lot of great grazing. So we basically feed them on good quality hay and very little else. At two weeks of age, Graham started to chew grass. The grazing uh, with the youngster actually has surprised us because at two weeks old, we noticed that he was picking at grass and starting to eat a little bit. And this was a little bit of a concern because from the keeper's point of view, they had to ask the vet, you know, is this normal? Because uh, is he getting enough milk? Is he looking for other food? And apparently with all equids, including domestic equids, they do start to pick at grass from two to three weeks old. It doesn't mean to say they're getting lots of nutrition from it. It just means that they're starting to pick it out of the, out of the ground. And what about gram stripes? There are many theories about why zebras are striped. The most common one is that they act as a type of camouflage. It's basically large herds of zebra will all run together and it's very difficult to distinguish the one end of a zebra from the other in a large herd. But in fact, new research suggests that a zebra's stripes might be a deterrent to biting flies, which can spread diseases. Scientists have found that hungry flies find them unappealing to land on. They think it has to do with the way the fly's eyes see the tight striped pattern. Researchers may never get to the bottom of this mystery, but Graham Stripes will continue to dazzle anyone who sees him. These baby animals all need to live within large groups in order to survive. Sometimes it's essential for mating. Other times, it's a good defense strategy. Big families can also help to raise little ones. For these animals, social living is simply second nature.